Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the 16th meeting in 2019 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Uh, for this meeting, George Adam is substituting for Angela Constance. Um, and the first item on our agenda today is our final evidence session on our inquiry into EU structural funds in Scotland. And I welcome to this meeting Ivan McKee, who is the Minister for Trade, Investment and Innovation, Hilary Pearce, who is the Deputy Director from the European Structural Funds and State Aid Division, and Susan Tamburini, who is the team leader of the Smart Growth European Structural Funds. And I invite the Minister to make a short opening statement, if he wishes. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, thank you for the invitation to contribute to your inquiry into the funding of EU structural fund priorities in Scotland post-Brexit. I know the committee is keenly aware of how important European structural funds are to Scotland's economy and society particularly in rural settings and smaller communities where attracting private investment can be difficult. It is difficult to think of a sector or region in Scotland that has not benefited from these funds since we joined the EU in 1973, and that is why it is deeply regrettable that Scotland is set to lose out on this much-needed funding as a result of the UK's exit from the EU. Regarding the current programme, the EU's aims of smart, sustainable and inclusive growth towards the Europe 2020 targets and the Scottish Government's ambitions of sustainable inclusive growth as set in the National Performance Framework are neatly aligned. We are using the European Social Fund to develop the skills of our workforce, alleviate poverty and increase social inclusion. The European Regional Development Fund is supporting SMEs and developing energy efficient renewable technologies to help Scotland transition towards a low carbon economy. Looking to the future, the committee is aware that the UK Government promised to publish its consultation on the Shared Prosperity Fund by the end of last year, and we are still waiting for that. The Scottish Government, in our dialogue with the UK Government on the Shared Prosperity Fund, have consistently reiterated five key principles. Firstly, Scotland should not lose out financially compared to the current level of funding it receives from the EU. Secondly, the devolution settlement must be respected. There must be no attempt by the UK Government to take back powers that the Scottish Government has rightfully executed to date. Thirdly, the Scottish Government's role in the development of Shared Prosperity Fund must be as equal partners. Fourthly, the current level of flexibility of allocation of funds should not be reduced. And finally, the replacement scheme should be operational in time to be implemented in early 2021 so that our stakeholders do not suffer any difficulties due to funding gaps. The committee members will be aware that we are running out of time to provide certainty about future funding to our stakeholders, and it is difficult to plan when there is no information coming from the UK Government, especially on simple questions like the value of the Shared Prosperity Fund. Uh, we cannot wait on the UK Government any longer, and that is why I have agreed with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Economy and Fair Work on a proposal for our own consultation exercise on future funding. I intend to establish a steering group made up of a range of stakeholders, including lead partners, delivery organisations and end users and beneficiaries of European structural funds. The steering group will ask key questions on future funding for Scotland, identifying possible priorities, administration practices, methods of allocation and duration of funding. The group will also collate existing research, including the evidence obtained by the committee, to inform the structure of the future programme to the Scottish Government. This work will generate interest not just across our huge range of stakeholders, but across ministerial portfolios. I will be happy to provide an update to the committee as that exercise progresses. Thank you very much, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, in that case, thank you, thank you very much, Minister, and thank you for telling us about the steering group. And I think you are right, some of the evidence we have certainly been taking around the country I think will be very useful to your steering group in terms of some of the, the very useful contributions we have had from many organisations. So, uh, in Scotland, the structural funds are currently worth £872 million across the seven-year EU period, and currently the Scottish Government is the sole managing authority and the largest delivery agent. <laughs> so, how does it see its role in relation to managing any future funding post-Brexit? And how is the Scottish Government preparing for the transition from the EU structural ones approach to try to any new funding arrangements? 
I, I think in, in terms of the role of the Scottish Government as the managing authority, we would see that continue. That is the, um, the most effective and sensible way to do it. It allows us to coordinate with the strategic priorities of the Scottish Government and uh, identify where the priorities are within Scotland for deployment of the of the funds. In terms of the uh, the transition, it's um, it, it's difficult to if you take a step back and look at the wider context in terms of Brexit, we're not even sure that we're leaving the, 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 the EU, never mind under what terms, we're not sure if there's going to be an implementation period or not. So a huge uncertainty even at that uh, that macro level. So we're having to watch all the, the bases, if you like. We're continuing to engage with the European Commission in, to ensure we're, we're up to speed in the eventuality that we stay in the European Union and continue with those programmes. We are pushing the UK government hard to understand um, some more information about the shared prosperity fund, and it's unfortunate that very little has been forthcoming there. So in terms of the transition, it's difficult to do that to any great level of detail. But as I said, the time has uh, come now where we can't wait any longer, and the purpose of the consultation will be to understand what the future programme should look like in Scotland from our perspective and the perspective of, of uh, users and beneficiaries in Scotland and also what that transition might look like. Okay. Emma, would you like to go on allocation funding? Sure. Thank you, Karina. Good morning. Um, I'm morning. interested in how funding would be allocated <coughs> because uh, we're seeing that you know there might be a UK pot and then some money will come to Scottish Government and then it will be further devolved to local authority, for instance, but how would you see allocation being uh, set up? Would it be needs-based, population-based, rural versus urban? How would that, how would that work? I, I, those are issues that the consultation will, will certainly look at. That's a core part of what they will, uh, what they will do. I mean, in terms of the overall picture, our red lines are that Scotland shouldn't receive any less money now than it, uh, than it is receiving uh, under the current programmes or that it would otherwise have received, um, for example, under any future EU programmes. So we're very clear on that in terms of the money that's coming to Scotland. Within Scotland, the mechanisms for uh, the distribution of that money at the moment is through the lead partner structure down to individual projects and applications come forward from projects through lead partners to, uh, to enable us to disperse that money. Um, I, the consultation exercise will look at the mechanics of how we do that um, and it will also look at, as you say, the most effective way to do that, to deliver benefits across uh, across Scotland. Clearly at the moment, Highlands and Islands is a separate um, area as a, as a transition area, so in, in terms of the EU process at the moment operates under under slightly different different rules with regards to match funding <coughs> percentages and so on and so forth, but all of that will be considered as part of this consultation. So is there a risk if the if there's a <clears throat> money that retains within the UK government because we've already seen issues with convergence uplift money that was due to Scottish farmers of 160 million pounds that wasn't delivered. So is there a risk if um, the UK government controls everything um, for funding in the future? Yeah, of course. There's always a risk of that. Um, the other point to, to, to bear in mind is that. The Shared Prosperity Fund, in terms of the, the, its size and scale, that has been considered as part of the Comprehensive Spending Review at UK Government level later this year. It's one of the reasons for the delay, but also it talks to um, that being wrapped up in other spending issues that will be considered at UK Government level. So that context is, is not as clear as we would like, and there's always, as you say, the risk uh, position is clear. And I think reflecting back on the evidence you've heard over the previous two sessions from uh, witnesses you've had, uh, I think by far the vast majority have been fairly clear that uh, those decisions should be made in Scotland. That's where the money should come and that's how we sh where we should decide what the priorities are. Okay, thank you. Some others might want to come back to this area later, but given, Minister, you've, you mentioned quite a, a number of times the relationship with the UK government, I think we'd probably better get into that area now. Patrick? Yeah, thanks very much. Good morning. Um, I mean, you, you've said a, a few things. First of all, that there is still very little information coming to you about the Shared Prosperity Fund. So, you know, I was initially going to say, has that moved on? Has the Scottish Government been given any more insight? But the, the answer to that seems to be no. Not in the last, not unless it's happened in the last 10 minutes. No. <laughs> OK. Um, and you've also said that there'll be the, the consultation. Uh, and did you say expert group or working group? Or Steering group. Steering group. Yeah. Okay. 
What's the relationship between the two? Is the, is the steering group then going to receive the outcome of the consultation oh. and decide what to do? What? No, the steering if, 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 well, there's two consultations. There's a UK government consultation mm -hmm. that was promised at the end of last year and hasn't yet uh, happened. We're still waiting for that. Um, in terms of the Scottish Government's consultation, the process will be that we will set up in the next few weeks the steering group, which, as I said, will have input from um, all uh, groups that are engaged in the process at the moment to get the best breadth of expertise. We have some uh, initial um, ideas round about the... Um, uh, the areas that may want to consider, which are the fairly obvious ones we've talked about, the regionality, the, the needs based, um, the, 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 the length of uh, the funding period, um, the balance between flexibility and the uh, control of public funds, all, all of those kind of areas that we've talked about. So the steering group will, will look at those questions and formulate a consultation exercise that will then be put to public consultation in the autumn. Um, and then that feedback will come back to the steering group, we'll have a look at that, and then the Scottish Government will engage to see how we want to take that forward as our position in terms of what uh, we think the, um, the, future, the, the Shared Prosperity Fund going forward should look like in Scotland, and we would hope to have that wrapped up in the early part of next year to get allow us time to move forward uh, into the future funding arrangements. So the timeline is, steering group is set up, it develops the consultation, the consultation exercise is carried out, and then ministers will decide and propose to Parliament or simply announce what their, what their prepared way forward is? The... I would expect that that would be through a process of a statement or an announcement of some kind. Um, but I'd be very welcome to come back to the committee to talk through that as and when we've got uh, clarity on where we're going with that. And as I said, very happy to keep the committee up to date on how we progress through that process as well. I mean, I, I get the feeling that from within the people that we've spoken to in Scotland, it's probably not going to be hugely difficult and controversial to arrive at some kind of sense of, of where we want to get to in terms of how these funds operate. Uh, the, the, the difficulty will be trying to achieve that outcome with the UK government. Has, has the Scottish government spoken to the UK government yet about its intention to consult uh, and uh, seeking any kind of engagement with that? We continue to talk to them. I mean, just running back, Ministerial colleague Ben McPherson um, spoke about this on the 13th June. Uh, Joint Ministerial Committee impressed the UK Government for a solution earlier uh, back in March. Cabinet Secretary Derek Mackay pressed for details and alert to Philip Hammond, etc. Et so there has been a whole series of interactions at ministerial level and um, many, many more at official level where we are seeking clarification from the UK Government on what that process looks like. So, to some extent, I think there, it's important that we do that work because there are a number of areas where the, the, it's, it's important to understand the balance we want to strike between flexibility and, um, and, and strategic intent, etc. Et yeah. So, I think that's important that we do that on our own uh, within Scotland. Yeah. But you're absolutely right, the engagement process with the UK government has not proved to be um, as fast moving as we would like. I mean, I'm sure we all appreciate and that. And that could be challenging. It's going to be difficult to get policy changes immediately from the UK government, given where things stand. But over the time scale that you're indicating, a consultation in the August, you know, it, it should be reasonable by that point to get some kind of indication of what, what the, uh, the incoming administration, the, the newly formed cabinet, is going to have as its policy intention in this area. When, when do you think Scotland needs that clarity? Well, we needed it months ago. Um, we are, the, the clock is ticking. I think... I mean, clearly there's their briefing paper that indicates that they want it to be based on the UK industrial strategy and with a focus on productivity as, as a mechanism to drive to drive um, uh, rebalancing of um, of areas that need to, to benefit from inclusive growth. So that that's their, their, their kind of broad outline statement. But I think the real challenge is on the funding magnitude, and as I say, that is now tied up, as we understand it, with the Comprehensive Spending Review, but also the mechanics, because you'll have spoken through um, and heard from witnesses round about the structure that we adopt at the moment compared to structures we adopted in previous um, programmes, the, the, the audit regime, the, the level of paperwork required, etc. There's a whole series of, of issues there that are built on the EU regulations. Um, I, 
clearly where the UK government is going in terms of the shared prosperity fund is important. How much scope will, will we have to define all of that ourselves? How much will it be constrained? Will it be constrained in the same way as the Commission has done, or will it be a different mechanism than the one used? So all of that very much informs the mechanics and the focus that we're able to, and the structure that we're able to design to execute in Scotland. Okay, thank you. Adam. Thanks, Kamina. Good morning, Minister. Good morning. Just immediately following up from one of the questions that Patrick Harvey asked mm. you. So, if, I, if, I, if I've understood this correctly, and correct me if, if I haven't, mm. um, there'll be a steering group over the course of the summer, a consultation in the autumn, um, pa paving the way for Scottish ministers to design and deliver and administer a, a Scottish prosperity fund that will be announced to Parliament by a ministerial statement? The, well, I mean, You've got to remember this in the context of the Shared Prosperity Fund, so it's us laying out the government's position on what our, uh, our view is on how the Shared Prosperity Fund should operate. Okay. Okay. So it's the UK government's fund um, in terms of uh, they, they have to, they are designing the Shared Prosperity Fund and they are putting the, the funding into that. Clearly, our red lines are around about that funding should come to Scotland and we should then be able to, to operate that. But we're having to work in that context. So we had hoped that there would be some framework to allow us to work within that. There is nothing. Okay. So we're effectively start with a blank piece of paper and okay. say, if we had free reign to design this, this is what we would uh, we would design something that looked like this. Okay. Because I, I, I'm curious as to how this fits um, in the um, framework of the Scotland Act between devolved competence and reserved competence. And, and you, you, you're, see, you're seeming to say that this is a, this is going to be a question for the UK to design. Um, uh, and it will be a question then for the for Scottish ministers to deliver uh, on the ground I I in Scotland. Is that right? No. What we're saying is that the UK government, as they ex exit the, the European Union, the funding that previously went from the UK government to the the European Union to fund the, the, their budget to fund these programmes, and that typically flown back to Scotland to allow us to run a program programmes here. That funding will be with the UK government because they haven't sent it to Brussels. They have said that they will set up a shared prosperity fund, um, and pretty much that's all we know about it. So we need to understand the framework within how that's going to operate or their proposal for that. Um, but clearly, our red lines are laid out, which are that the funding should there's you no know, detriment in terms of the funding to Scotland. Those decisions should be made in Scotland because of the impact it has on the devolved area and the way it's been operating uh, up to now. Do, do you foresee that this is going to require primary legislation in this parliament? Because at the moment, the, the, the authority under which the money is dispersed in Scotland is, is authority that comes from EU oh. law. You just put your hand on a very thick um, pile of, of papers yes. and said EU yeah. regulations. And that, that, I don't know what's in that file, but it might, yeah. might very well be that it's a fragment of uh, mm. EU regulations mm. in there. Um, uh, once the United Kingdom leaves the European Union, there's no guarantee that those EU regulations will continue to have any legal effect. It mm -hmm. depends on the terms of the withdrawal mm -hmm. agreement, if there is a withdrawal agreement. Um, so do, do you foresee, I mean, I'm not asking you to, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, just do, 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 just take this question out literally. Do you, do you foresee that there is a, uh, um, a possibility, a probability, a likelihood uh, that there might be a requirement for legislation for Scottish ministers to have the legal authority to act in this area? Uh, to be honest, it's not something we considered because um, expectation would be it's, it's a funding stream um, and that the funds would flow, as I said, to the Scottish Government who would then design a programme to execute on that. But um, I will go and look further into that and consider whether there are reasons why that might need to be the case. I, 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 think, it would be, I think it would be helpful because the, you know we, we know that there are... Um, uh, disagreements between the Scottish Government and the UK Government about where uh, certain legal powers will fall um, after Brexit. In particular, there doesn't appear to be yet any agreement about whether state aids regulations will be reserved or devolved. So it, it, in terms of the legal authority that underpins uh, the interventions that government can make um, to support um, uh, prosperity in the in the form mm. of EU structural funds or in the form of a, a UK or Scottish prosperity fund, uh, ha having a having a clearer sense than I currently do um, uh, of the legal framework of that and how the Scottish government foresee the legal framework of that rolling out mm. would, would I think be helpful, Minister. Well, we'll certainly can ha have a look and consider and reflect on that. I mean, I mean clearly there's there's, there's 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 many funding streams that operate without um, needing primary legislation, but we'll reflect on the question. Thank you. 
Alex. Thank you. Um, there's a quick question really about reporting requirements. Yeah, mm. I think before uh, we started taking evidence, there was probably a bit of a, a belief that a lot of the bureaucracy around reporting requirements yeah, originated in Brussels. Uh, but yeah, as we got into this, the reality was slightly different. Uh, but a lot of the, uh, the bureaucracy uh, seems to be homegrown and created by the Scottish Government. Yeah, I had a, 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 a organisation in the constituency, South West Aberdeenshire Citizens Advice Bureau, um, you know, who, who came to see me last week, uh, and they're still awaiting clarification uh, from the government uh, of what the new reporting requirements will be for in for monies that they paid out in 2017. Yeah, and this seems to be very much a case of, you know, not just a case of moving the goalposts, but you know, moving the goalposts you know, after the game's finished and everyone's gone home. Uh, so my question is, you know, do you, are you aware of these kind of issues uh, and what, what have you learnt from them uh, in, in looking at how you'd construct a new system? Well, um, <clears throat> I wouldn't accept that the Scottish Government invents bureaucracy for no good reason. The Scottish Government operates within the, the regime that we have here from the, the European Union. Um, which determines what we have to to deliver upon, um, and the that regime and the execution of it is tightly audited uh, at, at all levels, and we have to comply with that. So the I wouldn't accept the, the, the premise of the question that the Scottish government is is creating or inventing bureaucracy that uh, is unnecessary or um, putting in place barriers that don't need to be there. Um, I know the specific. I know that there are specific issues around about um, citizens and rights you're talking about. Um, I know that there are, there are issues in terms of the funding um, relationship and uh, some challenges in terms of the uh, communication they're having with Aberdeenshire Council. But as a lead delivery partner um, for those programmes and those projects, it's the council that is having those conversations with CAB, not the government. So it's, um, it's important to understand in that context, it's the lead um, delivery partners that, uh, that move that forward. So I think in that specific case, it's important to understand that in terms of the generality around about the, the bureaucracy, um, it's striking the balance between the making sure we spend public money correctly, as everyone would wish, but also allowing as much <coughs> flexibility as possible to uh, for, for organisations to execute on what they're, what they're delivering. But all of that has to sit within the context of the European regulations that are there. If there are specifics that they want to look at, then we can go into chapter and verse on the regulations and the Scottish Government's um, management system and understand exactly what the problem is. But, as I say, that's the context we're operating in. Yeah. I don't know if there's anything you want to <coughs> add on the specifics on that. Um, just perhaps for some context, um, it's important to... Um, be clear that the managing authority, uh, which is my team within Scottish Government, uh, manages the funds through the lead partners. So there are 45 lead partners across Scotland, including all 32 councils. And, and they, in turn, um, deliver the projects through the delivery agents, such as Citizens Advice Bureau, who do very valuable work. And it is, is for us in the managing authority to ensure that the lead partners um, uh, comply with the with the monitoring, reporting, compliance, and audit uh, regime that all member states have to for the European Commission, um, and this uh, th this is then audited by the audit authority on behalf of the European Commission and also directly by the European Commission themselves. Uh, thank you. I mean, I just think on the first bit where you where you say it's the it's all being directed uh, by the EU. I think we might want to go back and look at some of the evidence we've heard, uh, because a lot of the delivery teams who we spoke to, when they met with delivery teams in other European countries, they were surprised at the different levels of bureaucracy that was being imposed on them. But it wasn't all, you know, there, there, there did seem to be an element of choice uh, uh, up to the, the Scottish Government compared to other governments in other countries uh, who were imposing reporting requirements on on delivery teams, so you, you might just want to go away and look. Well, because I think you've got to remember that across <coughs> different countries and different programmes, there will be different structures designed to suit their requirements, so there will be differences in the way things are done. Um, that uh, That is the nature of the different types of 
projects and programmes that will be executed there. But if there are any individual specifics and they've got examples from other countries where things are specifics are done differently and they believe that there's something that's unnecessarily um, cumbersome in terms of the way the Scottish Government's managing that, then we'd be very happy to look at the specifics. Thank you. James, you're a supplementary, I think, on yeah, this. Yeah, it's a supplementary on this, uh, this uh, area. Just on this whole issue around the allocation of funding and uh, processes, the, the issue that came up recently about £22 million of funds been frozen, uh, there seemed to be a suggestion it was due to issues around audit process. Can, can you give some background on that? Yeah, sure. Um, the current situation is that the... Uh, there's a pre-suspension in place on the um, the ESF funds, um, and I, I don't recognise the 22 million. There's 9.6 million is the amount of money that's um, that's in the process that uh, that um, has been um, claimed by lead partners, the Scottish government but we're unable to claim that back currently from the EU. There's a number of issues in that, and it kind of talks to the complexity of the regime that we're, we're working under. Um, there's, there's four main issues around about that to do with uh, flat rate costing, to do, and three others to do with procurement issues. One of those to do with a public versus private, some confusion around about how those were defined, uh, issues around about grant award versus procurement, public procurement process and how those were defined and interpreted. Um, and there's an issue also round about the um, uh, yeah match funding and the level at which that operates within the, the structure. So there's a number of complex technical issues in there where the EU looked at that from an audit perspective and had some questions. So as a consequence of that, the pre-suspension is in place. But we're uh, very confident that's going to get cleared in the in the next few weeks and be able to move on. So just to be clear, the EU took a view that they had issues with some of the processes that the Scottish Government were working through, and that was the reason for the money being sus suspended? Yeah. Now, and just to be clear also on that, um, Lead uh, lead uh, partners are continuing to pay delivery agents, so it's very important to understand that. So no delivery agent should not be getting paid as a consequence of the pre suspension. So what you, you've given some general commentary around mm -hmm. around this, but yeah. what obviously it's a matter of concern. That this money's been frozen. What specific action are the Scottish Government taking to address it to ensure that these funds get released? The solution to all of those those four. Um, issues that were raised by the audit is a move to a unit cost system and that's something that's been agreed in principle by the, the EU and at the moment we're working through the details of how that would exactly operate in the Scottish context. So put it in um, clarity on that, the European Union um, made a change recently which allowed us to move from a system whereby you had to have a specific national um, unit cost structure to something where you had an off-the-shelf unit cost uh, system that was available across the whole of the European Union. That change has allowed us to move much easier in that unit cost system. So as we move towards that, that allows us to clear all four of those blockages around about the, the process issues that I've identified. The conversations with the European Union are moving forward on that and officials are engaged almost on a weekly basis. Um, and as I say, we are expecting that to be cleared um, in the next uh, certainly before November, but it should be, we'll get everything resolved prior to that, shouldn't be, uh, isn't, uh, uh, will, will all be resolved, I say, in that time frame. But as I said, the important point to recognise is that that is to do with the flow of funds from the EU to the Scottish Government to the lead uh, partners. The flow from the lead partners to the delivery agents on the ground has continued and hasn't been um, affected by this pre-suspension. How does a unit cost system work in terms of, like, a, you know, from the point of view of an organisation receiving funding, they will receive a, a block of money. Yeah. So how how does a, a unit cost system apply there? That works on the output. So, for example, if you're training a number of individuals, it will be based on so much per individual you've trained, rather than a system at the moment, which has typically been round about flat cost. So it's been the cost, either the actual cost or the cost for the number of people you're employing directly and then a percentage add-on on top of that for your indirect costs. So it's a change in the structure, but it resolves a number of the audit issues because there was misinterpretation round about how that flat cost uh, system operated in the current context. So the unit cost system is a solution to that. 
because the EU has changed the, the process and the rules around about that, recently it's allowed us to move towards that system and it will clear the audit issues. But that has been agreed in principle with the European Union and we're just working through the, the mechanics of how to roll that out. I think Neil had a question in this area as well. Yeah. yeah. Just on the, on the issue of uh, ESF money being suspended, um, I've asked um, in written questions for other stuff, projects in the West Scotland that are affected by mm -hmm. the suspension. Um, I don't expect you to list them today, but you know when I can expect a, an answer. Well, in terms of um, delivery bodies on the ground, the answer is none. Because the flow of funds, as I said already, from the lead partners to those local organisations is continuing. Right, OK, thanks. Well, you'd want things and outcomes, I think. Yeah, thanks very much, uh, Bruce. Uh, Minister, you were talking earlier about getting, having to get the process underway in, in the absence of any guidance on the SPF and what's potentially in it. And uh, I think you're quite right to do that. And you were talking as well about the European Union 2020 targets mm. and how they neatly align with Scottish mm. government targets. Um, what happens if, you, if we proceed down this route to develop the approach we would prefer to take? And then at some stage we get presented with uh, an, an entirely different approach from the UK government. It, it sounds as though that could be a pretty major moving of the goalposts at that stage. What's, what's your view about that and how would we potentially try to resolve those differences? If they well, are? It's, it, it's unfortunate, and just to reiterate the point again, the reason why we're moving forward um, at this point with the consultation and the steering group is because we had been waiting, asking, um, encouraging the UK government to give us more detail so we knew the context within which we would be working. We're now in a position where, as I say, we're starting effectively with a blank piece of paper and having to design something um, from the, the, the ground up. You're absolutely right. At any point through that process over the next few months, the UK government could come along and say, this is what we think it should look like. Now, they've said they're going to go through a consultation process, so I suspect that will run perhaps in parallel with their, their process, who knows, we'll, we'll see how, how that looks like. Um, but you, you're right, at some point they could come along and say, this is how we see the structure of the Shared Prosperity Fund working at a UK level. Um, clearly, we've laid out our red lines and within that context, there will be a discussion to be had. But even just looking at it, even if accepted all those red lines in terms of the funding value and how the, the level of control, etc., there could be, they could come along with their own book equivalent to the EU book, um, which would then, we would then be in a position of having to figure out how we have worked taking what we think it should look like, but within the context of the of the rule book that they would be wanting to implement. So yes, it could be messy at a number of levels, from the very detailed level up to the more overarching considerations. Mm -hmm. Are you getting any indication, though, that, that the UK government is willing to continue to embrace the kind of principles of cohesion and social inclusion that we are it, familiar with in a lot of these programmes? Are you getting any sense that they're divergent from those principles to something else? Well, as I, as I said, I think that the um, what, what we do know in terms of the statements they've made is it will be based on the, the UK industrial strategy um, and we'll have a focus on productivity as a mechanism to drive um, more uh, or, or to support or, or help develop um, least developed um, communities. Um, so that uh, is the overarching focus on it. But clearly, as you get into the detail of that, how well does that align with the Scottish Government's focus on inclusive growth um, and um, the economic strategy that we have and, and the, the focus we have? And, for example, round about our focus on climate change and low carbon, which has been a, a part of what we've driven in the existing current programme and would be... I don't doubt a very large part of what we might be doing going forward and how would that gel with what, where the UK government would be coming from. So, yeah, there's, there's potential points of discussion there as we move forward. Could, could you just finally gaze into your crystal ball and maybe give some idea when you might know? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't no. like to, wouldn't, wouldn't care to comment. Um, if, if, when, it's cloudy. If, 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 we know, if we know anybody who's, um, who's, uh, who, who's, who's able... To do so, and we, 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 do, we do know some, we may encourage them to go along to one of the um, uh, Conservative leadership hustings and ask the candidates what their view on the Shared Prosperity Fund and how they see it moving forward is going to be. Because the, the reality is that we're kind of stuck until a lot of those larger issues kind of shake down and we understand where we are. 
in a okay. bigger context. Thank you. George, I missed out you uh, in the round of questions. I think you still have a question on allocation of funds. Is it already been answered? It's more or less been answered. Okay. Can, I, can I ask, Minister, sure. one, some, some of the groups we've sp spoken to uh, who are very passionate about the way they delivered the European funding was the leader groups. And as far as your steering group is mm. concerned, will leader be represented or representatives of leader beyond that steering group, as well as the, because our, our um, evidence taken has involved a fair bit of evidence on the leader as well. Yeah. Yeah. I just have to be clear on that. The, the leader group falls outside my portfolio. It's, it's treated in that, the, 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 the rural portfolio. Um, so that is a point of discussion that we will have with ministerial colleagues about whether the scope of the consultation should encompass that. Because clearly I'm only empowered to, to, to set up the um, or moving forward with the consultation that includes the ESF, ERDF funds. So there is a discussion to be had with other ministerial colleagues, and that will be part of setting up the terms of reference that the steering group will operate under. Clearly, if there is, um, I think there's two ways to look at that. If leader is, is in scope and um, rural colleagues are comfortable with that approach, then clearly there will be an input there. But also take your point that there could be learnings from the way a leader has operated that may add value in, in a, a generic sense to the work that we are doing. So that is certainly something we will consider if there's individuals there who could add value okay. to this consideration. I know in the steering group itself and that uh, terms of reference, um, I, I'm, I'm assuming you will write to us at, at the, when, that's, when yeah. that's in place yeah. so the committee can at least understand where we've got to in that particular journey. Indeed. Is there any other questions any other members want to raise at this stage on, on this matter? There being no other questions, I therefore suspend this meeting of the Finance and Constitution Committee allow for a change over of witnesses. Thank you very much, Minister, Thank and you. your witnesses.
Okay. We'll just... Okay, the, the second item on our agenda today is to take evidence from the Scottish Government officials on the Referendum Scotland Bill. I therefore welcome to the committee this morning Rebecca White, who is the Referendum's Bill Team Leader, and Penny Curtis, who is the, De the Deputy Director of Elections and FOI. And we've got Colin Brown and Graham Fisher, who are both solicitor solicitors in the Scottish Government. Um, but before uh, we... Uh, uh, I, I welcome Rebe Rebecca, if you want to... Uh, make any opening statement? Uh, no, we're, we're, we're quite happy not to. Okay. Well, at, at this stage, can I also welcome to the meeting for the f first time in public um, Alice, Dr Alistair Clark from the University of Newcastle, who will be advising the committee on the bill. Well, given that th there's been no opening statement, I think I've got, got just a very, asked some very simple questions at the beginning. Then. Can you tell us in simple terms um, why the Scottish Government is proposing this bill? Uh, what's the aim and the purpose of the bill? Uh, does similar legislation exist anywhere else in the UK? Uh, and perhaps, or just to help for the record purposes, you could fill in some of these questions for us so we, for, and for, for the rest of my fellow members of the committee. Um, I'll start out. Thank you. Um, so what the bill does is proposes a, a legal framework for holding referendums on matters within the competence of the Scottish Parliament. So broadly, it is a technical uh, bill that sets out rules, um, including the franchise for any referendum, the rules around voting and conducting a poll, um, for uh, designation and participation in campaigns, rules on spending and donations. Um, the legislation is largely based on existing legislation within the United Kingdom and Scotland, uh, so it draws on the rules set out in the UK papera, but also um, the rules that were used uh, within the Scottish Independence Referendum Act. Um, we very much started um, from uh, the basis of existing legislation reflecting um, process that worked well, uh, in 2014, um, the referendum was considered to have been well run um, and it's been adapted to reflect changes and practice since then. Um, putting uh, a framework in place for referendums in Scotland was a recommend recommendation of the Independent Commission on Referendums um, and uh, reflects the fact that uh, electoral law is um, very dispersed, um, and this brings it together for, for a single framework in Scotland. Um, and what the bill does is ensure um, we have the rules in place for any future referendum in Scotland. So at the point of um, that framework being used, the debate can be about the actual referendum uh, and the merits of that referendum itself, rather than the technical detail of the rules. Well, thank you for that very g general overview. It was very helpful, actually. Um, but th there are some differences from the, certainly from the 2014 referendum bill. So I'd like to know why the Scottish Government has proposed that secondary legislation is being used to make specific, recommend, ref, um, in initiate specific referendums, and in particular in the area of the question that might be asked or the date set. Um, rather than using the primary legislation, especially given that the scrutiny period for primary legislation is obviously, in terms of its length and intensity, much greater than it would be for Parliament as far as secondary legislation is concerned. So why have the government chosen to take that direction? Okay. Um, the, the primary reason um, we have um, proposed in, in the bill that uh, the powers are to use secondary legislation is uh, around the certainty of the timetabling uh, using uh, secondary legislation and using the affirmative procedure. Um, that ensures we've got a predictable timetable um, from the point that um, secondary legislation is, is introduced. Um, it still ensures that 
Parliament has the opportunity to scrutinise that legislation and to agree or not with uh, the question, date and so on that's proposed. Okay, Adam Tonkins. Um, well, um, uh, sorry, I don't understand that answer at all. What, what, what is it about the timetabling of secondary legislation that's clearer than the timetabling of primary legislation that requires you to, to act in this way? Yeah, so um, the uh, time for considering secondary legislation is, is set out um, within the, the parliamentary uh, procedures, whereas there is a lot more uh, kind of flexibility in how long a bill uh, can take to proceed through those parliamentary procedures. Oh, I see. So the, um, the, 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 our standing orders restrict the amount of time that we can spend deliberating on secondary instruments. So the Scottish Government thinks that it's appropriate to restrict the amount of time that Parliament can consider referendum questions rather than having that in primary legislation. No, it, um, we're not looking at it from the perspective of restricting uh, that time at all. It's very much about the predictability of it um, to uh, enable a, a referendum on a, a certain time scale. But no, it's not at all about restricting the, the time but, for scrutiny of it. But what our, what our standing orders do is they restrict the amount of time that Parliament can consider secondary legislation. Is that not correct? It certainly puts a fixed timetable around So it that. restricts the amount of time that we can spend looking at, primary, at secondary legislation, and there is no equivalent restriction with regard to primary legislation. Is that correct? That's my understanding, That's yes. correct. Yes. Right. That's correct. So the, the, so the intention behind Section 1 of the Bill, um, uh, which allows Scottish ministers to uh, make regulations providing for a referendum, including, as the convener has said, the date um, of the referendum and the question. The intention behind that is to restrict the amount of time that Parliament can scrutinise those, those, um, those issues. No, I, I, I wouldn't characterise it that way. That's not the intention for why we've taken that decision. It's not about restricting the scrutiny. But, but with, with Our driver but, but with there. respect, your, your, your answer to the convener's question, and this was not going to be my line of questioning, mm -hmm. I mean, your sure. answer to the convener's question was that the reason why the Scottish Government want uh, to proceed by way of secondary legislation rather than prim primary legislation, you, you, your answer to that question was about um, uh, predictability and predictability of, of timetabling, and that, that took me by surprise. I, did, I mm -hmm. said at the beginning of my questions mm -hmm. to you that I didn't understand it. Um, and, but what you're mm -hmm. saying is that what you mean by predictability um, is that unlike for primary legislation with regard to secondary legislation, this parliament is restricted in terms of the amount of time it can spend considering uh, the instruments mm -hmm. in question. Yeah, that, that's certainly not what the intention be behind that is. It, it, it is, you're right in how I've described it, is there is predictability behind it, but the intention there is absolutely not about restricting scrutiny. And you know, clearly Parliament has the ability to scrutinise in there and indeed to agree or not with whatever's brought forward but, in but that legislation. The, but the effect will be that there is a restriction on the amount of parliamentary time available. That's, that, that's, that's understood. Um, what other countries in the world um, legislate for referendums in this way? That is to say, what other countries in the world confer on their ministers the power to make regulations setting out referendum questions? Yeah. Um, so, um, as I'm sure you know, that there's a very wide range of, of different approaches to administering referendums in different countries, and um, it can be difficult to draw exact parallels uh, between the, the legal systems and uh, the ways in which referendums are run. Uh, in developing the bill, uh, we looked at different jurisdictions that have uh, general uh, legislation covering the administration of referendums, so including Denmark, Ireland and Poland. Um, some of those um, have general legislation that provides for some types of referendums, not others. Um, so, for example, in New Zealand, governments can initiate non-binding referendums, uh, and they have citizen-initiated referendums, um, but binding referendums can't be used under that framework. Uh, so. We looked at a number of different examples uh, on the uh, issue of, of what a framework does. Um, I can't, at this moment, give you specific descriptions of examples that have process exactly analogous to the secondary legislation process in the Scottish Parliament. No, I know you can't, because there isn't an example anywhere in uh, the Western world, is there, of another country that um, uh, proposes to uh, uh, um, construct a framework for referendums in this way? 
Um, this is unprecedented, isn't it? Uh, as I've said, I, I can't give you a specific example on that. There, so there, there, because there isn't one. There isn't, there isn't a precedent or an example that you can point to anywhere in Europe or anywhere in the Commonwealth that enables ministers to set the uh, date and question of referendum questions in the way that's provided for in, 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 in Clause 1, or in Section 1 of this bill. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Thank you. Um, uh, the, um, you, you talked um, uh, about binding referendums. Is it the intention that referendums established under this legislation will be binding? Um, I'll say that. Sure. Um, yeah, so um, because uh, the referendum framework is it intending to provide for, for any referendum that you might wish to hold within devolved competence, uh, it is silent on the question of whether referendums are binding or not. That is to ensure that there is flexibility for the different circumstances in which you might want to, to run polls for, for kind of different... Uh, decision-making purposes. So d d does the Scottish Government understand there to be a difference between a referendum and a focus group or an opinion poll? Yes. What's it, what is that difference? I, gu I guess a, a way of kind of reframing that, that question is perhaps, uh, you know, what scenarios referendums would be used in? Uh, is that kind of what you're, what you're asking? Or... Well, m m my understanding is that referendums are devices that decide things, um, and decisions, by their nature, are binding. Yeah. Is that the Scottish Government's view? Yeah, I see. Um, I think um, for the framework, given that there might be referendums in different circumstances, kind of setting out a process in the legislation that, that says this is how things will proceed once the referendum has been conducted. It, uh, we felt it was not appropriate uh, to set out kind of a, a singular process that, uh, that does okay. that. The idea is that the framework can be uh, used for, for different polls and therefore requires some flexibility around the kind of the circumstances and okay. the packaging. So the intention, just to be clear, the intention behind this bill is that some referendums established under this bill might be advisory non-binding, and other referendums established under this bill might be binding, but we're not quite sure on whom they would be binding. I don't know if it, it's worth saying that I mean, there's certainly no provision in the framework for making a, a referendum binding legally in any way, as with the, uh, the independence referendum, for example, in in 2014 under the, the, the 2013 Act. So, um, so, I mean, that, you know, certainly that's, that's the legal position. Uh, the legal position under this bill as introduced? Yes, I mean, it, 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 as with the, the, the 2013 Act, it's, it's not binding in that sense, but of course any referendum might have a significant political and moral force behind the, um, the decision of the, the people, and I suppose Section 1 um, of the Act provides for the referendum to be held throughout Scotland, so it would be a vote of, of, of those throughout Scotland, those who live in Scotland. Okay, but, the, but as introduced, this bill doesn't resolve and doesn't seek to resolve the uncertainty that exists in the United Kingdom at the moment, including in the United Kingdom law, about the binding nature of referendum decisions. No, I think that's correct, yes. Okay, so it's the, right, thank you. Final question for me, Camille, if I may. Um, yesterday, the, I think it was yesterday, certainly within the last few days, the Constitution Unit at UCL published a blog on uh, the bill uh, that we're talking about, and I want to read you a uh, quotation from that blog and asked you to ask you to reflect on it. This is the quotation. I am aware, says the author, of no well-functioning parliamentary democracy that gives ministers blanket authority to call a referendum by secondary legislation. The proposal, he's talking about the proposal in section one of the bill, the proposal runs counter to the principles for good referendum design advocated by the Independent Commission on Referendums and the Council of Europe. Both emphasise that the decision to hold a referendum is a big one and ought to be subject to exhaustive scrutiny, unquote. What's the reaction of the Scottish Government to that? Um, I think we, we've set out the reasons why um, we um, have proposed uh, a secondary legislation uh, power. Um, clearly, Parliament will want to consider uh, the provisions that are in this bill uh, and um, how they... Uh, might want to uh, take evidence on that um, and uh, consider it in, the, in uh, its scrutiny uh, as we go through the bill process. 
But do, do you accept or do you not accept that the proposal in section one of this bill runs counter to the principles for good referendum design advocated by the Independent Commission on Referendums and the Council of Europe? Um, I'm, I don't particularly want to, to get drawn into the, the kind of pros and cons of the policy um, that has been set out uh, in the bill. That wouldn't be appropriate for me to do so. Um, it, it's something you'll uh, clearly want to be taking evidence from ministers as, as the bill's been uh, going if, through if the process, that, if, if you forgive that. It wouldn't be appropriate, and, I'm not, and it, wouldn't also, it also wouldn't be appropriate for me to ask you that, which is why I'm very careful not to ask you that. I'm asking you whether you accept or do not accept the view published on the UCL's Constitution blog that, as a matter of fact, the proposal that is in Section 1 of this bill runs counter to established international standards of best practice with regard to referendums as set out by the Independent Commission on Referendums and the Council of Europe. Do you, does the Scottish Government accept that verdict or not accept that verdict? I'm not entirely sure that I do accept all of what's set, set out there. Um, I think as, as I set out um, at, at the start, uh, there is still a process for scrutiny and approval of what um, is in a referendum question, timing and, and so on, and we're not trying to circumvent that uh, with the legislation. And I think the purpose of having this uh, debate around whether that is appropriate um, in this bill and in consideration of the bill um, gives me uh, a degree of confidence that that is tested as, as we're going through the process. Okay. Uh, I've got a couple of supplementaries in this area. So, Patrick. Thank you, Convener. Uh, just on the, the initial questions that Adam Tompkins was exploring there on the question of timing, uh, the regulations uh, would be subject to the affirmative procedure. I wonder if you can tell us whether the government has given consideration to using the super affirmative procedure, which would allow more time and flexibility uh, for, for scrutiny, both inside Parliament and beyond, uh, of any regulations that were proposed. We haven't done it at this stage, but recognise it is something I'm sure the, the committee will want to consider as it's looking at the so that's legislation. Not that, that's not something the government has ruled out? It's not in, in the proposals that have been brought forward and the provisions in this bill, uh, but we, we recognise this is something that, that the committee is, is going to be uh, looking at Thank you. as it goes through its deliberation. Tom, you've got a supplementary in this area as well. Yeah, right. Thank you, uh, convener, and good morning. I uh, just wanted to clarify around the issue of scrutiny. Just makes me a very simple question, but just for my own benefit. Um, in, in Section 1, the Scottish Ministers must consult the Electoral Commission before laying a draft. And then in Section 3, subsection 2, um, for a reference to consulting the Electoral Commission, in subsection 2, in a Clause B, um, there's a need to lay a report before Parliament as well. So that would have to take place, so there would be a, a pre scrutiny before it even reached Parliament in the first place. Is that fair to say that fair yeah, that understanding is, that is correct um and there's nothing that precludes the government consulting wider within the more widely within the legislation as it's drafted is there uh, yep there, there is nothing in the framework that excludes that possibility so there would be an extensive period of consultation with the electoral commission potential for further consultation more widely mm. and then via the process uh for secondary legislation as set out in parliament there would be a 22-day period for the DPLR committee, which would scrutinise it thoroughly on technical grounds, uh, before a further 40-day period for a lead committee to report on it, likely this committee, where a motion to annul if the negative or to reject if affirmative would be possible. Is that correct? Is my understanding correct? Yes. So I just wanted to clarify around in terms of what, what room the Parliament had for, for scrutiny. That's, that's fine. Thank you. Um, thank you. Willie. Thanks very much, Bruce. Just before I ask my question, could you just remind us, the European Union referendum, was that also advisory? Yes, that's yes. advisory. Thanks, so. thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, could I ask you for your views about overlap with reserve matters? Uh, the bill proposes a 28-day purpose period and so on. It also talks about um, control of financial donations, perhaps, during a referendum. 
talks about electoral registration and potential surges of registrations and how systems might cope with that, how we can make sure that the UK government, which would have a clear interest in a referendum process in Scotland, how that can be respected during the further period, how we, we manage issues about concerns about broadcasting and data protection and so on and so forth. Could you just give us a flavour of what your thoughts are about potential overlaps with reserve matters here, please? Yep, I'm um, happy to do that. Um, uh, do you mind if I take the registration one first? Is, is that okay? Um, so, uh, as you say, aspects of the registration system, probably most notably the uh, website through which voters uh, register, uh, is reserved to the UK government. And since the devolution of elections powers in the 2016 Scotland Act, the Scottish Government has been working with the UK government to ensure that uh, where kind of our policy intersects with reserve matters, there is good cooperation and kind of close joint working to ensure that that system, whilst controlled by the UK government, is uh, able to flex to allow for Scottish policy decisions. Um, I think that the best thing to point to is that there's a uh, specialised user journey for 16 and 17 year olds through that website, uh, which was put in place after the Reduction of Voting Age Act. So um, I think uh, on registration matters, uh, it would be uh, a matter of kind of uh, negotiation and um, and cooperative working with, with the UK government. Um, Picking up the issue of PERDA, the framework includes uh, provisions uh, which are um, kind of analogous to some of those in, in PAPERA uh, that limit the activities that public bodies can undertake in the 28 days before a poll. Um, that, uh, within a, the competence of, of this bill, can uh, only uh, legally bind Scottish public authorities. Um, if we uh, were organising a poll where there was a, a UK dimension to it, then any restriction on UK public bodies would be done by negotiation with the UK government, as uh, happened in the Edinburgh agreements uh, and was uh, was respected by, by different public bodies. Um, in relation to some of the aspects around donations and permitted participants being able to check registers, um, they will have access to publicly available uh, versions of the register for UK registers. Uh, any kind of further access would require agreement of the UK government. So, so supposing there was some <coughs> pressing conflict during the process, I mean, how, how quickly can one party influence or stop a process that it's unhappy with, instead of waiting until it's too late uh, post the process to complain about that. How, how quickly can the system respond to concerns that are perhaps expressed by um, either side? Uh, is, is this in relation to in any of these breaches? Ones, suppose, imagine it was a broadcasting issue or, a, or we discovered that there was a huge financial donation coming from somewhere and there was an objection raised to that by any party. How, how, how quickly can the system respond to, to deal with that during the process, do you think? Um, so, during uh, the period where the Electoral Commission are acting as regulator, um, they uh, carry on monitoring of, of campaign activity during that period. Uh, so, for instance, taking your donation, um, if it was felt that there was a uh, suspicious donation, then uh, that information could be passed to the Electoral Commission and they can uh, take action as they consider appropriate. The bill also includes provision for something called a stop notice. Um, which is uh, effectively uh, a notice to a campaigner, campaign group during the campaign period that activity uh, that they are undertaking is, is going to be in breach of, of the campaign rules and that they should not do it. So th there is um, some provision for, for ensuring that any issues that are identified during a campaign period are, are dealt with. And the Electoral Commission are very familiar with dealing uh, with reports of, of kind of any sort of issues to do with campaign regulation from their work on other elections and referendums. Did you touch on broadcasting? Uh, yeah. Mm. Thank you. No, certainly, broad, the broadcasting framework legislatively would remain within the control of the UK government anyway, and in, in the detail likely to be subject to the to the broadcasting regulators, as was provided for in the Section 30 order in relation to um, the independence referendum at the time, and similar provision could be made by Scotland Act order, um, whether under Section 104 of the Scotland Act or, or otherwise, to provide for um, broadcasting regulation if the UK government 
government agreed in consequence of, of the Framework Bill. So we'd have to obtain agreement rather than... The, OK. Yes. OK. Thank you. James. Uh, thanks a lot. I've got a question about Section 3 uh, on the interpretation of referendum questions. So subsection 5 says that the Electoral Commission uh, have got to publish a report on the wording and the intelligibility uh, of any question. Um, but subsection 7 then goes on to say that uh, this, the section, this, the whole section, section 3, doesn't apply uh, if the Electoral Commission has previously published a report uh, on the question or the suggested wording of question of question or statement. So uh, one that, that, that potentially could be interpreted as obviously the Electoral Commission ahead of the 2014 independence referendum published a report on the question uh, that, that was that was being considered. And that subsection seven could be interpreted that that report stands and that in terms of any new independence referendum, the Electoral Commission doesn't have a role in terms of looking at the question or the wording of any statement. Uh, I just wondered what your, what your interpretation on that. What, what was the policy intent of that? Okay. The, the policy uh, intention <coughs> there um, is um, where uh, questions have already been tested, um, have been used, <coughs> are, are familiar to voters and understandable to voters, um, is not to put a requirement in there to test again. Uh, partly um, the process of question testing is, is quite an expensive one, um, in probably in excess of £100,000 to do, th do that. Um, but our main policy intention in there is uh, not to do anything that gets in the way of voter intelligibility around that, around that question. So in, in terms of the example I gave about another independence <coughs> referendum and the Electoral Commission's role yep. around the 2014 referendum, would the Electoral Commission be asked again to look at the question on any, on, yep. and any uh, potential statement? So the framework wouldn't require ministers to get the Commission to test the question again if they were um, seeking to use the same question again. Right, OK, that's quite clear, but I think there's, there'll be an issue about that, convener. But it's a political issue. Yeah. OK. Um, <coughs> Emma. OK, thank you. Um, I'm interested in the length of time for referendums, because um, we've seen that there's been various 10 weeks, 16 weeks, 14 and a half weeks, depending on what referendums have been presented. So I'm interested in, you know, obviously we need to make sure that spending and donations are transparent and traceable and, and clear. So um, is the intention to follow what the Electoral Commission recommend, which would be a 16 week, or would there be flexibility in this? Um, so, uh, okay. As. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there we go. Surveillance. Um, so, um, as the uh, as the framework is is designed um, to accommodate a range of, of different possible referendums, um, the referendum period is not specified in the legislation. That is something that would be set by the regulations that established a, a particular poll. Okay. I have a wee supper also about the binding versus advisory. Um, so if we were asking a question that was based on a uh, reserved matter, for instance, there seems to be a difference in where Scotland might want to it, um, use a public health policy for drugs and alcohol, and Scottish Affairs Committee are looking into this right now. So currently drugs are, drug policy is reserved to Westminster. So could a question be asked in this bill that would be based on a reserved matter, but that would be a better way to gather the information from people in society, which would be more stronger than a focus group, but then it wouldn't be binding because it's a reserved question, a reserved matter. Is that an example that is understandable? Yeah, yeah but I think the basic answer to the question is that because the, the, the framework bill is intended to be used for um, 
questions within the, the competence of the, the Parliament. The, um, the bill wouldn't allow a question about a reserve matter in, in that way okay. at all, I suppose. OK, thanks. Uh, Alex. Uh, good morning. Um, uh, forgive me if I've missed it, but you have a, for me the most important uh, bit is missing, which is how, how do you decide the winner? Uh, it doesn't seem to be provided for uh, in the bill. So I'm just wondering if you can maybe point me to the, to the bit of the bill which does uh, specify, or if it's not specified, uh, how or who is the winner decided? It's decided by those who analyse the outcome of the vote. So, if in an advisory referendum, it produces a result, and those who look at it make of it what they wish. Sorry, but I, I thought you said earlier the bill, it, it, it could be binding or advisory. Um, if it was binding, then the rules around the binding nature of it would say what is to happen. Yeah, so the, the bill, as drafted, doesn't include rules that kind of specify how a referendum would be legally binding in the sense that um, people would be obliged legally to, to follow the, the result. Um, picking up um, the point in relation to majority or kind of thresholds. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the bill um, does not set out any provision for kind of additional majority thresholds or, or kind of other ways of approaching that, which effectively uh, means that uh, from the bill as drafted, it's a simple majority. So, so you're saying, so if it's not, if it's not, just to be clear, so if it's not spe specified uh, within the bill, then the threshold for turnout and victory and majority, qualified majorities and all that would be in section one under the discretion of the minister? Uh, uh, the bill as currently drafted does not include that as part of the regulations. Um, Graham, I don't, I don't know if you've got any. Well, tell me, did, the, did the 2013, if I've got that date right, referendum bill uh, act, sorry, um, include such a definition? <laughs> No, I mean, there's, there's no provision in, in, in that either. It, it simply makes provision for, for the vote and then um, the announcement of the, of the outcome. In and fact, and I, did, the, did the referendum on the EU <coughs> um, act no. contain such a provision? No. So, well, and so, so just to finish, yeah, given you know, a lot of the discussions over the previous referendums of, uh, of what thresholds should be, uh, have there been any discussions with ministers around around that issue? Have they asked to, for you to look at, uh, if there are examples in other countries of of what defines majorities or what are preferred? So, we've not specifically looked at, at the question of what uh, different thresholds might apply or turn out, but um, our approach. Uh, of ministers fairly consistently has been around just straight majority in for the outcomes of results. But, but yeah. it's not planning on being specified. I've got no okay. plans to. Thank you. There was some discussion. 2014, Paul, about what would happen if the vote actually produced a dead heat, and the bill would not have answered that, or the act would not have answered that question. The, the only one, the only referendum in the UK, I think, that actually mandated a specific outcome. I've, I, I could be wrong, but from memory, I think the 2011 alternative voting referendum mandated the government to bring forward some legislation in the event of majority in favour of a particular proposition, if that helps. I think Patrick's got a supplementary in this area. Yeah, I mean, just, just briefly, um, given that the, the, the framework and legislation for a referendum, there are certain things that it needs to do, explaining how the referendum would be conducted, um, what the rules for participants are, how the count is to be uh, carried out and announced, and, and who carries out those functions. Uh, is, it, is it the intention of the government to say that the decisions about what to do with the result are political judgments, and that for the government of the day to say, we will honour the, the decision of the people if a simple majority, or if a two-thirds majority, uh, or we will we will restrict our, our actions uh, if there if there's not a, a majority. That that is a political judgment, and shouldn't therefore be set out in the legislation or in the framework. Is that the is that the intention here? It, certainly, that's the 
approach of having that discussion in a political or parliamentary space is the approach that has been used in most referendums to And that date. would be quite normal. Yeah. Thank you. When you go. Sorry, a follow supplementary in this area from yeah, Adam. Yeah, thanks. Not, not on the binding nature of the result, but on the threshold question which Alexander Bennett was asking you about. So, if a minister wanted to put a question to referendum and wanted to use the Section 1 power to do that, under that Section 1 power, could the minister in the regulation set a threshold at more than 50%? So, Sorry, under Section 2. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, under Section 1, it would be under Section 2. Right. But uh, So could a minister, thank you for that, uh, could a minister <laughs> using regulation-making powers under this bill um, establish a referendum um, in which the result was not 50% plus 1, but was a higher, or indeed a lower, <laughs> result than that? So th the threshold would be a question for ministerial regulation rather than for legislation. Yes, certainly. I mean, if obviously if Parliament agreed to, your know, Parliament would have control over the affirmative regulations and, and, the, and would have to pass that before, before and, it could... Be and, there's, and there's no like power in Papira, is there? So they, the, the, the ministers don't have powers under Papira um, to change threshold or indeed turnout requirements in a way that they would have powers under this legislation if it was passed in this form. Certainly Papira depends on other legislation providing for the um, the mechanism for the vote in that sense, although there are some ministerial powers in Papera as well about what can what can be applied. So. When you say other legislation, you mean other primary legislation? Yes, Papera relies basically on, on other right. primary legislation, okay. though, as so I just say, some clear, regulation making powers. Ministers have the potential power under this bill um, to set threshold requirements or to set turnout minimum turnout requirements for referendums established by regulation under this legislation and there are no like powers in UK legislation? Yes, provided Parliament agreed to those, obviously, because it's yes. affirmative. Okay, um, Neil, franchise issues. Yeah. Mm, obviously, this bill will overlap with the um, forthcoming electoral reform and franchise bill. When can we expect that to be published and so uh, the Electoral Franchise Bill has now been introduced right. and published. Okay. Um, the Electoral Reform Bill uh, is uh, scheduled, I, I think, uh, shortly, is, is okay. probably the, the best estimate of timing. Okay. On, on the issue of the franchise, this bill has obviously been drafted whilst we're currently members of the European Union. Um, if and when the U UK leaves the European Union, is it the suggestion that all residents, EU citizens who are resident of Scotland will have a vote in all future referendums in Scotland. Um, and what about non-EU citizens that are resident of Scotland, for example, people from Canada or Australia or New Zealand or America? Yeah, um, so on the issue of EU citizens, um, in the bill it's clear that EU citizens, as currently happens would be included in the franchise and ministers have been very clear in in many public statements that their intention is to keep eu citizens in the franchise for all devolved elections uh, so that that's kind of a clear policy statement even even after even if we leave the european union yeah so right. um and, okay. and drawing on a previous job here okay. um th my my understanding is uh that uh, that there has been quite a lot of consideration of, of how to do that and that even uh, in a number of Brexit scenarios, EU citizens will continue to be allowed to register and vote in Scotland okay. in those scenarios. But not, not uh, you know, uh, citizens of Canada, Australia, so, USA and New Zealand who are resident of Scotland? Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. I'll, I'll just, just come to that. Yeah, so... Um, the Electoral Franchise Bill has now been, been introduced mm -hmm. to the Scottish Parliament, and that includes uh, proposals to extend the franchise to, to nationals of all countries who are legally resident in Scotland. That would include yeah. people from, from New Zealand. Um, the franchise in this bill at the moment is uh, set to what the current local government franchise is. That electoral franchise bill is hoping to amend the local government franchise. Uh, obviously, we did not want to uh, kind of prejudge the Parliament's scrutiny of that additional piece of legislation. Um, it's an important debate. It's uh, subject to supermajority. Uh, 
clearly the Parliament will have a, a lengthy discussion about the mm -hmm. merits of the proposals in that bill. Um, once uh, that bill has concluded its parliamentary passage, uh, there is the ability uh, under powers in this Act to update this Act to reflect that change in electoral law. And in his statement to the Parliament, Mr Russell was clear that his intention would be to, to do that to ensure that the franchise for referendums continues to match the local government franchise. And you mentioned the, the local government franchise. Um, obviously, we're talking about referendums in Scotland here, but for, in you know, times past, local authorities have actually organised referendums, Strathclyde Water, yeah. congestion charging. What is the legal position in terms of local authorities running referendums, and would this impact or could this impact on them? Um, so, uh, this, act, uh, that this bill provides for uh, referendums uh, that are held across the whole of Scotland. Uh, it does not uh, facilitate referendums held in a single local authority or multiple local authority areas. There is existing legal provision that helps local authorities to do that. Okay. And given the, uh, the weight and, and the, the gravity of some of the rules, particularly on the campaign side, uh, taking into account wider policy around community empowerment and democratic engagement, it was felt that uh, it would be incredibly heavy-handed uh, to, to mean that, that local referendums would have to follow some of the rules in, in this bill. But there's still provisions for local authorities to hold yes, referendums um, legally? Yes, this, this makes yeah. no change okay. to... Okay. So from that, obviously, yeah. this would then be out there and local authorities could look at it and decide how they design a local referendum, but it leaves that for local authorities to determine okay. in local circumstances. Okay, thank you. Murdo. Um, thank you, Commissioner. First of all, my apologies for arriving late. I was at the um, REC committee moving amendments to the Transport Bill, so I missed the very start of your session. So my apologies. Um, can I ask a little bit about the, the, the policy intent behind uh, the bill? Um, we know the Scottish Government have talked about the prospect of an independence referendum. Are there other issues which ministers have discussed with you they might want to put to referendum? Uh, no, ministers haven't talked to us about other issues, um, but what they've been clear about is wanting to have that framework in place so um, it is there and available for whatever issues may come up in the future. Right, thank you, that's very helpful. Um, I mean, we know that in other countries, for example, Switzerland, there's quite a... Uh, tradition of putting issues to, to, to referendums or referenda um, is, um, if we're going to be precise, um, is, um, I, mean, do, 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 I mean, do you get a sense from Scottish ministers that there's an interest in pursuing more referenda? That's the direction we might go in? Um, ministers haven't, haven't made any um, uh, kind of statements about how, how they see um, referendums being used more or less or, or I I exactly the same. What, what they have been clear about is, is recognising that they have a legitimate place um, in how democratic decision-making and involvement takes place uh, in, in Scotland. Right. That's quite an interesting response you've just given me, because what is that place? <laughs> um, I I think, um, I mean, just being very um, thoughtful uh, about how I set, set that out, I mean, clearly uh, ministers have uh, used a referendum uh, previously on an issue of significant um, importance within Scotland. Um, so I think I, I would point to that as, as an example. Um, I think um, from what uh, the First Minister announced in her uh, statement in, at the end of April, where she um, announced that um, we were going to bring forward this particular bill, um, she also set out other ways um, that she uh, wanted to involve uh, the people of Scotland in thinking about uh, the future of the kind of country Scotland is. Um, but beyond that, um, I, I don't think I can sort of offer more uh, okay. around your question. Okay, okay, sorry, but I, mean, I think you've, you've, you've just clarified that as far as you're aware, there's nothing else in contemplation that 
ministers Nothing might want to put to referendum other than independence. Talk to us about. Yeah, okay, thank you. Patrick, you've got a question on transparency. Thanks very much. Um, I think there were some questions uh, earlier from uh, Emma Harper about uh, donations. Uh, I wonder if I could explore that and also uh, the question of um, publications and, and campaigning. Um, has there been an attempt to <coughs> l learn any lessons from the, the, the two big recent referendums that have taken place, 2014 and in particular 2016? Some of the concerns around so-called dark money, uh, the, uh, the, the lack of ability for members of the public to know who is spending what and how, uh, and if there have been attempts to, to learn those lessons and, and implement changes, could you could you pick out for me what are the specific changes that have been made uh, compared with how we conducted the 2014 referendum to take account of those concerns? Uh, yeah, so um, taking kind of the, the two recent referendums in turn, uh, the uh, draft referendum bill that we published for consultation in 2016 included a number of updates that were intended uh, to respond to issues that had emerged from the 2014 referendum, uh, picking up issues from the Electoral Commission's report on the conduct of that poll. Um, subsequent changes to the bill, uh, which uh, then kind of transformed into, into this one, um, also picked up further points from electoral stakeholders and wider debate. Uh, one that I, I can point to particularly is around online imprints. Uh, so uh, refining the drafting that was included in the 2013 Act to more closely capture campaign activity rather than restricting individual freedom of speech. Um, so there's been some update there. Uh, there's uh, also um, been updates to other aspects of the, the campaign regulation. Um, kind of moving on to talking about the EU referendum, um, as, as you say, um, the EU referendum significantly increased interest in and attention to uh, referendum campaign rules yeah. and um, concern about the ways in which those could perhaps be, be manipulated. Um, we have looked at the recommendations of the Electoral Commission and other uh, electoral uh, bodies and, and kind of... Uh, groups with interest in this space. Um, I think it's fair to say that some of the, uh, what you might term policy remedies to some of those concerns are still very much under uh, development from uh, bodies like the Electoral Commission. Uh, the debate on, on how best to, uh, to improve electoral legislation as a result of uh, the lessons learned from those polls is still ongoing. and. Um, as uh, I think Mr. Russell set out in, in his statement, we, we are interested in comments on the bill and um, to consider how uh, we can continue to make sure it meets the ambition of, of being gold standard. Do you think that's achievable within devolved powers? Or are um, there concerns around the, the limits on, on what the Scottish Parliament can legislate for to, to address these concerns? So. Um, Picking up on the difference between elections and referendums in terms of uh, how the rules are devolved, um, I think um, there is decent scope within the powers of, of the Parliament to make a number of improvements um, and uh, to, to help ensure that the, the framework is as robust as it can be. Can I give one example? Um, in 2016, large amounts of money were spent uh, on online advertising, uh, including graphics created by uh, Aggregate IQ uh, and the, the Leave campaign. Uh, many of these have been criticised as uh, extremely misleading and containing outright lies. Uh, obviously, an, an allegation which they would refuse uh, or refute, but uh, the allegation's been made. Political advertising is not regulated, uh, and we would clearly be out with devolved competence to try to change the, the exemption for the Advertising Standards Authority that pre prevents it from regulating political advertising. But as far as I read the Scotland Act, the, um, the reservation on misleading advertising in the Scotland Act relates to consumer protection and trade and industry. So would we be within devolved competence to say that we're going to regulate misleading political advertising? 
I mean, I suppose it's complicated, as my, <laughs> my friend, my uh, initial reaction to that. Um, certainly, the, um, the broadcasting framework generally, including the, the rules on political advertising, in that sense, is, is reserved, and the, the bill would depend on, as I mentioned earlier, um, using a reserved powers with the agreement of the UK government as under the Section 30 order to make some of the regulation for broadcasting, which is required. But that said, there's quite a lot of leeway about what the framework can provide for within devolved powers. Um, there are some other complications on that restriction, like the ability of the Parliament to make any provision in relation to the BBC is completely out with competence. So, um, so that, again, that depends on provision being made by Scotland Act orders. So, um, so I think you know any particular provision would have to be considered very carefully as to as to what what the provision itself would would be and uh, and explored with the probably explored with the UK government as necessary to ensure that something robust and reliable could be could be put in place. Setting aside broadcasting for for the moment, though, let's let's imagine there was a the, there was a referendum on um, banning. Banning cheese, uh, and and I was I was campaigning uh, against that and saying if we ban cheese, everyone in Scotland will starve. You know that that would be a lie. That would be misleading advertising. Uh, people people might be unhappy that they couldn't eat cheese, but people would not starve. Would it be dev within devolved competence to say that you cannot publish uh, in the print media uh, a, a misleading advert in that in that sense? I think I can just say yes to that. It would be devolved um, in the print. If in the, the print media, I think okay. that's I think that's correct. I, I would want to reflect on the, the detail of any particular and, proposal, but uh, and online, uh, yeah, online again, I think it would it, it, the the bill as it stands does regulate matters which happen online. It, it's it, you know, it's when you get into the restriction on um, political advertising about which there is particular provision, then then that you know they're, they're about broadcasting that you run into the reserved okay. the reserved areas. Thank you. Adam. Thank you. Two two mop up questions arising out of um, other, other things that you said this morning. Um, does section four of this bill require a two thirds majority in the parliament to pass? Uh, so um, we are, are clear that uh, this bill does not engage the supermajority super provisions in relation to franchise, um, as the protected subject matter is around the Scottish Parliament franchise rather than the local government franchise. Um, we, we don't think it engages that. And, and Scottish Parliament elections. Yeah. yeah sorry. Of, yeah. of course, thinking particularly of franchise. That's okay. Section four. Thanks. Um, and, and in relation to your answers to Murdo Fraser's questions and th thinking about the other issues that um, we could see referendums on in Scotland, issues other than, than independence, um, I mean, what if a minority government um, can't get its budget through this parliament? Could a minister then lay regulations under this act putting that budget to a referendum? And could those regulations specify... Um, that the outcome of that referendum binds the Parliament. <laughs> I, I suppose if the Parliament approved the affirmative regulations, but right. uh, so the power, the power, in, the power in sections one and two of this bill is potentially so broadly drafted that ministers would be able to use it, subject to affirmative procedure, to bypass a vote in Parliament voting down the budget. Thank you. No further questions. <laughs> uh, Graham, I, 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 I was, I was yeah, just going to say, I don't see how that listen, bypasses listen, Parliament. But, uh, but, but, yeah. Listen, if you, if you need to reflect on that and come back to us, do. But, uh, um, and sees that as a way to bypass a deadlock and invites ministers to bring such regulations, I suppose. OK, <laughs> right. Thank you very much witnesses for coming along today and giving us your evidence uh, um, and uh, I'm going to suspend now for about 10 minutes um, to allow for a change of witnesses. Thank you very much.
Um, our third item on our agenda today is to take evidence from the Scottish Government officials on the Non-Domestic Rates Scotland Bill. And I welcome to the meeting Karen Sibbald, who is the Non-Domestic Rates Scotland Bill team leader, and Anouk Berthier, who is in the Non-Domestic Rates team bill as well. And I can invite Carol to make an opening statement if she wishes. Very happy, convener, just to move straight to questions. OK. Um, as part of the, this, the information we got back in relation to response to the financial memorandum, uh, a considerable number of individuals were opposed to the removal of charitable to relief from independent schools, claiming that will result in more children moving to state schools as parents will not be able to afford increased fees, thus increasing, obviously, the burden on local authorities. Um, how do you respond to these claims? Um, well, it was a recommendation of the Barclay Review which ministers decided uh, to uh, implement. Um, in terms of the analysis that uh, has been done within the Scottish Government, um, looking at various sources of information that's available to the public in terms of rateable value, <coughs> the amount of charity relief, uh, received by each of the affected uh, schools, the sort of breakdown of income between charitable relief uh, and, and income as a percentage is across the board, uh, it totals 2.9% of income. Um, I'm aware that uh, uh, as any business, schools do have a variety of costs to take on board. Rates is uh, just one of those uh, elements. OK. Martin. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, good morning. Maybe I can just pursue that issue a little bit further if I can. Um, when I saw the financial memorandum, I was somewhat surprised that there was no um, allocation of additional costs to local government in relation to the um, introduction of non-domestic rates on independent schools. Now, you know, the bill is proposing, I think, a, a £7 million uh, annual tax take from uh, independent schools in an area like Perth and Kinross, which is part of the region I represent. There are a large number of independent school places. I think there are uh, several, several thousand. Many of these independent schools, uh, they're all charities. They, they, don't, they don't run at a profit. They operate on quite a marginal uh, financial situation, um, and therefore, uh, to to meet these additional uh, rates charges, the only way they will be able to do that is either by increasing fees to, to parents, or uh, by reducing the availability of bursaries, or perhaps a combination of both. And therefore, um, there, you know, it's a simple law of economics: if you if you increase the cost of something, you will reduce demand for it. There will be a number of people currently choosing to send their children to an independent school um, who will, as a result of uh, fee increases or bursary reductions, may not make that choice in future. That will mean that they will therefore uh, go back into the state sector. There will be an increase in costs to the local authority, such as Perth and Kinross Council. So I'm wondering why, in the financial memorandum, there's no reflection of the fact that the cost to, to local authorities, where there's a high incidence of independent schools, such as Perth and Kinross or indeed uh, Edinburgh, um, there's no reflection of that in the financial memorandum. The figures in the financial memorandum, the impact on local authorities, we were provided by COSLA. Um, and a number of people have made the point that you've made, uh, mainly those coming from the independent schools. There's no reflection. Um, I, I suspect because in terms of estimating how many are going to come they may leave one independent school, they may choose to go to another. Uh, they may come into the, the local authority. Um, local authority monies are sorted out on a uh, needs basis. Any additional, the education element of that is based on number of pupils. So additional, if there were to be additional costs, then they would be reflected. Um, however, it's something that we're alert to that people have commented on and we can explore further in discussions between the Scottish Government uh, and COSLA and, uh, as necessary, make a, a change, if that's appropriate, to the financial memorandum for stage yeah. two. Yeah, th thank you for that. I mean, you, you, you say, you know, if, if there were additional COSLA clauses, that would be reflected. 
which was which which is a perfectly fair point to make. Um, it's not in the financial memorandum at the moment, but if if the objective of this change is to raise seven million pounds um, in non-domestic rates from the sector, you can easily see a scenario where the additional cost to the public sector exceeds £7 million. So this ends up being a, a, a policy that actually costs money rather than reduces it. I mean, just to give you an example, you know, if in very general terms in Perth and Can Ross, if 10% if of the pupils currently attending independent schools were to choose to uh, attend a, a, lo a, a local authority school instead, that would add something like £2 million in additional revenue costs to the local authority. And that's not taking account of any additional capital costs that would be required from building new capacity. Now, that's just one council. You know, in Edinburgh, the figures would be much more substantial than that. So I know you've said you might want to look at the financial mem memorandum, but uh, can, I, can I suggest that that's something that, the, that does need to be addressed if, if, the, if the bill and, and the financial memorandum is going to have proper parliamentary scrutiny? Prepare to take that yeah. point on board. Okay. Thank you. Patrick. Thank you. Um, just Following up on that, is there, um, whenever we, we talk about taxation, there, there'll be uh, some, some pleading from people who would quite like to pay less tax, thank you very much. Um, is there any actual evidence base that the government has available that would allow it to, to predict or to model uh, the, the, the demand for, for uh, private fee-paying education if this, if this change comes in? Or are we just looking at numbers plucked out of the air, like 1 in 10 or 1 in 30? Uh, yeah, we, is, is we there don't know, because obviously that's down to the individual choice of, of parents um, as to what, what they choose to do. Um, it, it depends on how, the, as uh, Mr Fraser has just indicated, it depends on how the schools deal with it, whether they use uh, any reserves that they may have, whether they increase the fees, whether they absorb it, you know, how they, they choose to do it, reduce bursaries. So, um, you so know, I'm not quite sure how you would model the unknowns. So the, the moment the, the government doesn't have any evidence base for saying this would be the extra cost uh, based on, on lower take up of, of private of places, fee paying no. education. Okay, thank you. James. Uh, thanks, Convener. You know, just in terms of the, the overall numbers in the financial memorandum, obviously it totals um, £100 million pounds, uh, over a, a number of years. <coughs> the bulk of that, about two thirds, uh, comes from ratepayers, about £67 million. Pounds. Can you just give a bit of a description of, in terms of the thinking behind that and how that roughly breaks down? Uh, yes, absolutely. So, in terms of the non domestic rates uh, increase in tax bill, uh, this is focused on the independent schools and the cost of adding commercial activity on parks. Um, and so that is set out in detail uh, in the bill in Table 1. Um, and so the cost, as you said, on independent schools in terms of revenue is £7 million in 2020-21. Um, and in total, that totals to £37 million over five years. And commercial activity on parks will be legislated for from 1st April 2020. So that cost is reflected uh, from <coughs> that year onwards and will cost a total of £5 million over the next three years post-2020. And then I think there, there is a, the additional costs, the civil penalties, um, uh, which will, of course, only become payable if ratepayers are not complying with the requirement to produce information either to the local authorities or to uh, the Scottish assessors. And we should say that we make quite clear in the financial memorandum that the um, costs for the penalties can only be illustrative at this point. We have ongoing discussions with councils and assessors on the use they could make of these penalties, but of course that depends on ratepayers' compliance and what councils and assessors decide to do with those powers. Okay, thank you. No other members indicated a wish to ask any questions. I therefore thank our witnesses for being here today. I know it's a short session, but very grateful for you. You're taking part, and I now close the public part of the meeting. Thank you very much. <laughs>